In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Dear Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we live in the days of talkative Christianity. In discussions we avoid decisions. We want our choices, our options. The middle road between Caiaphas and Pilate, between Judas and Peter. Teach us, O Lord, that there is only one royal road, which is the way of the cross. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The holy hour of which we spoke is to be continuous. I can think of only one way in which it could be broken up, and that would be if one made, for example, 45-minute meditation before Mass and 15-minute after, that would be a continuous hour because certainly the Mass would not break the holy hour. It is not to be done in segments because it takes a long time to get rid of the dust of the world. We almost have to walk that seven-mile journey between Jerusalem and the breaking of the bread at Emmaus. Now in this meditation we're going to be concerned with how the Holy Hour is to be utilized in dealing with our scallops. S-K-O-L-O-P S. Scallop. What is the scallop? That word is used by St. Paul in the second letter to the Corinthians. He speaks of the revelations that he received from God and he was lifted up into the third heaven and told secrets that could be revealed to no man or even be repeated. And then he said because of that exaltation he was humbled. And so to keep me from being duly elated by the magnificence of such revelations, I was given a sharp physical pain. That's a scallop. A sharp physical pain which came as Satan's messenger to bruise me. And this was to save me from being unduly elated. And three times I begged the Lord to rid me of it, but his answer was, My grace is all you need. Power comes to its full strength in weakness. I shall therefore prefer to find my joy and pride in the very things that are my weakness, and then the power of Christ will come to rest upon me. So he was given a scallop. Remember in the reims Douay version and in the Jerusalem version, it is called a thorn in the flesh. In the Vulgate, it is called the stimulus carnis, as if it were a strong uprising of concupiscence. But the word actually means a stake, not a thorn, but some very large piece of wood that would be driven into one, as if impaled on some kind of trial. Now, what was the scallop of Paul? We do not know. The English version is a physical handicap. Uh, one suggestion is that it was malaria, because two of his companions left the malaria country, they could not endure it. Another suggestion of Tertullian was that he had epilepsy. I wonder, however, if it was not a physical handicap of the eyes. A disease that made him repulsive because he says that. I know that my looks are repulsive. As I once heard a high school student say after she read Paul, she said that fall from the horse didn't do him any good either. 
In any case, he was blind for several days afterwards. And that it was his eyes is indicated too by what he told the Galatians. He said, you would have plucked out your eyes for me. As if to give them to him. And then at the end of his letters, he said, see with what big letters I write. And then when he struck the high priest, he said, I didn't even know it was the high priest. It doesn't make very much difference what it was. We can speculate endlessly. Everybody's got a scallop. We have a scallop of our own making and we have a scallop that the good Lord permits us to have. It can be physical health. It can be the trials of life. And it can be burdens that are thrust upon us. Demosthenes stuttered. Moses stuttered. That was his scallop. And he asked God to rid him of that defective speech, and God said, no, if you have to talk, Aaron will talk for you. Can you imagine Moses coming down from the mountain and stuttering out the Ten Commandments? And David certainly had a scallop. Jeremiah despaired. John the Baptist had a scallop. He was in prison, and the Lord did nothing to let him out. Here he was working miracles, but the Lord would break down no bars for John the Baptist. He would only say he was the greatest man that was ever born of woman. Miriam, the sister of Moses, had a scallop. It was a pride. She wanted to be like Moses. Then she was struck with an extra scallop, which was leprosy, and removed only through the intercession of Moses. So we all have trials. Now we learn how to handle a scallop in meditation, close union with the blessed Lord. And the first point to be kept in mind is that God does not speak to us in words. He speaks to us in events. He speaks to us in what happens to us. And because we do not meditate and bring the scallops of daily life to the presence of the good Lord, we are very apt to miss their meaning. For example, an accident happens to a certain person. And that could be, and sometimes there's a chance for conversion. As a matter of fact, I wonder if there are really any accidents. St. Paul says, all things cooperate for good in those who are called to be saints. And St. Augustine adds, even sin. Now take, for example, the dropping of a cruet. In Yugoslavia, some years ago, a young boy was serving Mass, and he dropped a cruet. And the priest slapped him. He said, get out, never come back. He never came back. That's the present communist leader of Yugoslavia, Tito. If that priest had ever come to the good Lord in order to review what he had done, there would have been perhaps some remission and an altering of the effect. I can remember when I was a boy serving at the cathedral under Bishop John L. Spaulding. I was about seven years of age. And I dropped the wine cruet at the offertory. 
Now let me tell you that there is no atomic explosion which can equal in decibels of intensity the sound of a cruet falling on a marble floor corum episcopo. <laughs> I was frightened to death. And we older boys thought he was a kind of a stern man. And after Mass, he said, Come here, young man. Where are you going to school when you get big? Well, to a seven-year-old boy, big as high school. And I said, Spalding Institute. That was the high school named after him. A much more diplomatic answer than I thought of at the time. He said, I said, when you get big. Did you ever hear of Louvain? I said, no. Did your mother? I shall ask her. Will you go home and tell your mother that I said that when you got big, you were to go to Louvain, the University of Louvain, and someday you will be just as I am. So I went home and told my mother what he had said, and she said, yes, that's a great university in Europe. And I never once thought of that incident until I'd been ordained two years and stepped off a train at Louvain. I said, oh, this is where Bishop Spaulding told me to go. It was an event that some way altered my life, as it altered the life of Tito in the opposite way. The people we meet by chance. For example, I was... Well, I didn't intend to tell this story, but I have to start it now. After preaching the three hours at St. Patrick's, a woman came back of the main altar, her hair disheveled and hunted and haunted looking, and curse me violently. And I said, why did you come in here? She said, to steal purses. I said, did you get any? No, she said, that second word of yours got me. The word of the good thief. And then she said, why should I be talking to you, you blankety blank, blank, blank? You will tell the cops. And I said, do I look as if I would tell the cops? She said, well, I suppose that anyone who can recite poetry like you can wouldn't do it. But that was the only argument she had. I said, why do the cops want you? She pulled out clippings from the Los Angeles Times and FBI folders. Three of her confreres were in St. Quentin and the FBI were looking for her. And I asked her if she'd ever been a Catholic, and she had been up until the age of 14. So I heard her confession, and she became a daily communicant, was unable to work. I supported her for about 20 or 25 years until she died, just a year or two ago. Well, I was harboring a criminal. And so after some time, I said to her, I must make known to the FBI that I know about you. And she agreed, and I told the FBI, I said, you're looking for someone, man or woman? I said, woman. Do we want her badly? I said, yes. Oh, yes, her name is so-and-so, yes. She's a daily communicant at St. Patrick's, yes. You have done far more for her than we could have done or the prisons could have done, so we're letting her go. So this chance incident of coming into a church on Good Friday to steal persons was an event that needed interpretation. And think of the crosses, the handicaps, the stakes that we have in our priestly life that are brought into the prayer of the holy hour we will begin to see that God is talking to us. Now, not only does he talk to us in events, but here we have a beautiful opportunity to distinguish between acceptance and rebellion in the face of all of the scallops of life. 
Acceptance, I will be done. Rebellion, why did this happen to me? The two thieves on either side of our blessed Lord are perfect examples of these two attitudes. One of the thieves asked to be taken down. If you're the son of God, save yourself, save us. The only reason he wanted to be taken down was to go on with the dirty business of stealing. And the other thief asked to be taken up. And he died a thief, for he stole paradise. And paradise can be stolen again. Now we have many disappointments in life, maybe parishes we would want, positions we would want that we never get. And then the misunderstanding in parish and office life. All this is the fuel for abandonment to the will of God. See, we are losing in the church today the sense of mission. We're no longer sent. The Father sent the Son. The Son sent the Apostle. The Apostle sent us. We don't want to be sent. We want to choose where we go. We want our options. So we never can be very sure that we're doing God's will. We're sure that we're doing our own. And generally when we get what we want, we don't like it. And please God, we'll soon get back again to a deep sense of, Lord, what do you want me to do? Just tell me. And hard though it be, I spent two years in graduate work in Washington after I was ordained, and then I was abroad for about five, making about seven years in all of graduate work, and I come back. Oh, yes, I had two chances. I sent the bishop two letters. One letter invited me to start a school of scholastic philosophy at Columbia University. The second letter invited me to go to Oxford with Father Ronald Knox to open the first Catholic college at Oxford since the Reformation. I sent the two letters to my bishop, and I said, which shall I accept? He said, come home. <laughs> he sent me to the worst parish in the diocese as a curate. Only 20% of the parish could speak English. It was the off-scouring of the earth. None of the streets were paved. And I said, all right, this is it. This is what the Lord wants me to do. And I was perfectly satisfied. And after about a year, the bishop phoned me and he said, you're to go to Washington, Catholic University, as a professor. I promised you three years ago. I said, why didn't you let me go when I came home? He said, I just wanted to find out whether or not you would be obedient. Now run along. So I've been running along ever since. <laughs> now if I had my option, either one of those two, heaven knows what would have happened to me. So it is not our will that matters, it is the Lord. And this is the difference between prayer and worship. Tell this to your people and let us drive it into our own souls. Prayer is the expression of my will. Worship is the acceptance of God's will. The two are quite distinct. Just run through the Old Testament and see how very often, for example, one of the great biblical characters like Abraham prays to God, expresses his own will, and then God says to him, offer your son Isaac. And he prostrates himself. That's his worship. Another beautiful instance is David. As we read in Second Samuel. This was after Nathan told him that he had killed Uriah. And when Nathan had gone home, the Lord struck the boy 
whom Uriah's wife had borne to David, and he was very ill. Now David loved this wife that he had stolen from Uriah, Bathsheba, and he loved the child, and David prayed to God for the child. He fasted. There is something that's passed out of our life. I don't want to talk about it, but I only just mentioned it in passing because I can't fast. I get headaches, I can deny myself little things, but fasting for two or three days or is something I, I can't do. When I was giving the retreat to the Lutheran ministers, one Lutheran minister told me that he's introduced fasting into his parish and he said it's, it has completely rejuvenated his parish. As a matter of fact, the first four presidents of the United States all asked for fasting from the citizens, except Thomas Jefferson. Well, coming back to this, David prayed to God for the child to live. He fasted and went in and spent the night fasting, lying on the ground. And the older men of the household tried to get him to rise from the ground, but he refused. And he would eat no food with them. On the seventh day, the boy died. And David's servants were afraid to tell him. They said, while the boy was alive, we spoke to him and he did not listen to us. How can we now tell him that the boy is dead? He may do something desperate. David saw his servants whispering among themselves and guessed that the boy was dead. He asked, is the boy dead? And they answered, he is dead. Then David rose from the ground, washed, anointed himself, put on fresh clothes, entered the house of the Lord and prostrated himself there. Then he went home, asked for food to be brought, and when it was ready, he ate. The servants asked him, What is this? While the boy lived, you fasted and wept, but now that he's dead, you rise up and eat. He answered, While the boy was still alive, I fasted and wept, thinking, It may be that the Lord will be gracious to me, and the boy may live. But now that he is dead, why should I fast? Can I bring him back? I shall go to him. He will not come back to me. And David worshipped the Lord. So the difference, therefore, between praying and worshipping is my will and God's will. The two are quite distinct. It very often happens that when we have little opportunity to do our will, then we can become much closer to the Lord by accepting his. And in the book of Ezra, the prophet Ezra, we read a thought that we need to dwell on very often. Ezra says, Now, after all that we have suffered for our evil deeds and for our great guilt, although thou, our God, hast punished us less than our iniquities deserve. Indeed, if we are honest, we admit that we all receive less blows than we deserve. So in the holy hour, therefore, we will not only pray, but we will worship. And we will begin the work of transferability of merits. Because inasmuch as we live in a mystical body, the merits of one can be transferred to another. The believing wife, says St. Paul, sanctifies the unbelieving husband. The believing husband sanctifies the unbelieving wife. No man lives for himself, said Paul, and no man dies for himself. 
There is this transfer of the faith, as it were, of, of the wife to the husband and vice versa. If we burn the face, doctors will graft skin from another part of the body to the face. If we are suffering from anemia, doctors will transfuse blood from another member of society to us to cure us of that anemic condition. If it is possible to transfuse blood, it is possible to transfuse sacrifice. If it is possible to graft skin, it is also possible to graft prayer. So that in the holy hour, our prayers, our petitions, our adoration will be transferred to certain members of the parish. And when we visit the sick, we will ask them to transfer their pains to the sinners of our parish. And where do we learn all of this? We learn this great mystery before the Eucharistic Lord. To interpret our life, not to think of our prayer life as that which is just limited to official prayer, but it is embracing all of the circumstances and details of life, interpreting them in that hour. I believe that every single person in the world, in his heart, is either on the cross or underneath it. On the cross with Christ, I am crucified with Christ, said Paul. Our celibacy, our loneliness, our trials, we're on the cross. Those of us who are suffering are more physically on the cross, but they need not be more cordially on the cross. The Blessed Mother and St. John and the women at the foot of the cross were on the cross by sympathy. So everyone in the world is either on that cross by recognizing the merits of Christ and by sharing that cross, as we will show this afternoon, or else under the cross. And many of the faithful today are under it. Come down. Come down and we will believe. There is a new disease creeping into the church, storophobia. Storos in Greek is cross and phobia the fear. Storophobia. Anything but discipline. The Holy Hour, therefore, will train you in the delicacy of abandonment and resignation and acceptance of God's will and utilizing all of the actions of the day. For as the poet put it, not all the crosses are on hills against the livid sky. Not all the riven hands are scarred nor all the pierced hearts die. We face a thousand little deaths that none may see or guess. What sc scarring wounds we hide beneath our body's loveliness. The little song that missed its way. Love, patient and unclaimed. Old scornful words whose memory still turns us sick and shamed. A smile that flicked a scorpion lash. Gray eyes that did not heed. The friend beloved and leaned upon who failed us in our need. Not all the crosses are on hills. And, O oh God, keep in sight those who come down from Calvary with hands unscarred and white. For on the last day, the Lord will say, show me your hands. And we will have to have the scars 
as he had them. And once we take that one scar of the hour and give it to him every day, then we can be sure that he will say to us, Come, beloved of my Father in heaven. God love.